Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Father Mr. Packer. Welcome to Threshold of Hope. Before we start taking a look at today's document, Fides Aracha, I want to mention that today is the solemnity of the Annunciation of the Incarnation of Jesus Christ to the Virgin Mary by the Angel Gabriel. And it's always a double-sided feast. On one hand, it is very much about the phrase in the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh. And in the grotto of the Annunciation in Nazareth, you can see on the floor, on the base of the altar in an alabaster base, hic verbum incarnatus est. Here the Word was made flesh. But there's also this, uh, the other side of it is that it's a feast of Our Lady as well, because while God made the invitation, she said yes. And a lot of us are familiar with the Latin single word response, fiat, let it be. But it's also true in Aramaic, when she would not have spoken Latin, I don't think. She would have spoken her own language, Aramaic. And in Aramaic, it's also a one word response, nehwe, let it be. And, you know, that one word of her yes to God, her, her nehwe, her let it be, is something that is a model for us. Every time we go to Mass and at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, we say the Amen after the priest says, through him, with him, and in him. Our one word Aramaic response should be modeled on her yes and that her acceptance of God made flesh into our lives for the sake of our salvation and that of the whole world. So the day is a great feast, and because it's a solemnity, it's a day off from Lenten abstaining and stuff. So have fun for a few more hours. <laughs> All right, we are now going through the encyclical by Blessed John Paul, Fides et Ratio. And again, you can get a paperback copy from EWTN's Religious Catalog. Simply go to EWTNReligiousCatalog.com or you can call 1-800-854-6316 and order that paperback copy. Another way to get it is to download a free electronic copy of Fides et Ratio. This you have to go on the computer to ew10.com, go to the document library, type in Fides at Ratio, and you can download it from our site for free. Also, we want you very much to be involved and participate. Uh, you can do like these nice folks have, mostly from the great city of Louisville, uh, Kentucky, uh, with folks from other parts of the country and the continent, in Canada. Uh, come down here to Birmingham, where the global cooling is not quite so severe as it is up in Canada. Uh, or you can also uh, send us a question by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or you can call during our live broadcast, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Of course, adjust it to your own time zone. And the phone number to call is 1-800-221-9460 if you are in North America. If you are uh, in another country or if you're right here in Birmingham, just call 205-271-2980. Of course, we try to give priority to anybody calling from another country. All right, we are now beginning paragraph 55. And again, just to keep background, we've been going through the ways in which the church has intervened when there are various philosophies and theologies that are intellectually not right, that they've sort of gone astray. They've opened up, you know, rabbit trails that just don't go very far uh, in the right direction and don't help lead people to truth. And 
as of last week, we got as far as the time of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century. That's why here in paragraph 55, Pope John Paul begins with today and the situation we have now. And we see that the problems of other times have returned because there is a basic principle that uh, I, I learned uh, this verse back in graduate school. My professor assured me back then that I was too young to be citing that. Now I'm not. And it's Ein Kol Chadash Tachat Shamish. There's nothing new under the sun. See, I told you I'm not, you know, I'm old enough to know that. And this is one of the things. Rarely do you have new heresies or new dumb ideas. They, uh, basically, people are borrowing from past dumb ideas. And the only difference is that they give it a new twist or a new key. It's no longer a matter of questions of interest only to certain individuals and groups. Because in the past, you know, so many folks in the past were just trying to survive. If they knew how to read, that was a good thing. But oftentimes, it was just trying to make a living. But now we do have, especially in the Western world, a lot more leisure and a lot more communications. And so some of these ideas, which still remain dumb, get uh, put into big business. You can make a lot of money off of dumb ideas. <coughs> and so that they, these, these false convictions are widespread and they become part of the common way people think. It's all over, scattered throughout. So uh, he gives a number of examples. First, there is a deep-seated distrust of reason. This is, this is problematic, that you have a lot of people. Uh, let me just give one little clue where some of this comes from. How frequently do you hear people using the English language poorly? They don't know their grammar. They don't have a very wide vocabulary, and they don't want to. In fact, one of the reasons I think there is so much of an increase of vulgarity to the extent that a lot of people use it without even reflecting is that it's become a form of punctuation, especially in some of our urban areas. It's not even an expression of anger all the time. It's just part of the way people speak. Instead of using a comma or, you know, they'll use words that I won't use. And, and the reason I bring that up is language is the basis for reason. The, the basis for logic comes from the structure of grammar. And in a culture where even in the schools, the teachers do not correct your grammar nearly as much as they will correct what is politically correct or incorrect. That they really get nervous about. If a boy chews his Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun, he has to be kicked out. Watch it, it there's jelly in this. <laughs> And it's strawberry, so you know what that means. So, you know, so, but they oftentimes are, do, and, but if you, th th there was a comedian who spoke and said, if you use logic and facts, you are now considered to be mean. And he's, he's bringing up a point in a lot of places. And, uh, this is uh, uh, going on in a lot of uh, political, philosophical research. There's um, a number of new philosophies. Uh, for instance, there's one by, called uh, uh, Deconstructionist Philosophy. Uh, it's promoted by a guy named Derrida. And uh, he 
uh, doesn't have trust in reason, it seems. Again, I don't uh, know how he forms logic, but this is uh, something where you have people like uh, so some of the modern philosophers who speak about there being the end of metaphysics. We don't trust the ability of reason to think. I, I, matter of fact, I came across this with an atheist some months ago who said, I don't want to think about the nature of being. I don't care about that. Can you prove it scientifically? Well, what I was asking him to show me is, is science scientifically provable. I can't think about that. Well, you know, the, uh, that's not good. You should be able to think about that. But this is something that people say, I, I just like what scientists tell me, if you don't know how to question some of those basic presuppositions of science, then if a scientist says something, I guess I got to believe it. Such as when Darwin, we talked about this last week, when Darwin said people from Africa are a species in between human beings and apes, they're a subhuman species. Well, that's science, isn't it? He was a scientist, so we should believe it. No, 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 no. We have to examine these things, and you need reason to do so. And some people are afraid to use that. You don't, you know, ask, any of you have college students, grandchildren or children, ask them if they take any courses in logic. Probably not. Probably not. Engineers might. A lot of engineers do. Because they need logic to make things work. But a lot of folks disregard it. Philosophy is expected to rest content with modif modest tasks, such as simple interpretation of facts, or an inquiry into restricted fields of human knowledge or its structures. In other words, they, they, they will let philosophy examine a few areas, but in terms of the purpose of life, or even whether there can be a claim to a purpose for life. That you, you can't bring up. And I remember when uh, I was in graduate school, two of my uh, roommates were medical students. And they were warned against thinking about things like teleology, which means what is the goal of something? Don't think about the body in terms of its goals. Well, you know, Philosophically, that's not smart. Does not the stomach have a goal, which is the digestion of food? And does not the palate have a different goal, which is to taste the food, to see if it's edible or not? But if, you know, and think about people who live for the palate and eat for the palate and not for the stomach. If you eat only for the palate, you can make a diet out of potato chips and soda pop because they taste good. But that's not good for the stomach, is it? And, and they complain about obesity and stuff. Well, you have to teach people that there is a purpose. But again, you have a lot of folks who don't want to think about that. And then if you say that there's any kind of purpose to something like sexuality, a purpose such as procreation being the primary purpose of sexuality. Oh, now that's oppressive. Hardly politically correct. And it's the pleasure that it's all about. Well, that's like thinking that food is only for the palate and not for nourishment and the digestion of the stomach and the other organs of digestion. And you become as gluttonous sexually as you do for food which is not good for you on lots of levels. So this is where philosophy comes in, and people don't want to think about those questions. Also, there are problems in theology. Temptations from earlier times. For instance, there is a certain rationalism 
in, philosophy, in, in theology. Now, think about this. In, you know, the, the, the difficulty with this is sometimes theologians will say that certain currents of philosophy and ideas among philosophers are the basis for judging whether something is true. Let me give you an example. There was a philosopher named Martin Heidegger, and he proposed in his philosophy that man is a being toward death. That the, this is the whole, the, the, the core of understanding human life, that you are going towards death. Well, one of his very good friends, Rudolf Bultmann, applied that to theology. And because he then interpreted the resurrection of Jesus from the dead as an escape from death, which it is, then he said, we shouldn't believe that. The, the community sort of felt Jesus' presence, but there was no real empty tomb. There was no real resurrection. And we have to keep our focus on authentically being focused on death. And the resurrection saves from that. And the same thing with the miracles. The miracles are a way out of the, the, the aspect of life that leads you to death. So he cut it out. In fact, one Episcopal priest, you know, came up with a Bible where he took out, he used a, um, uh, a little uh, razor knife, exacto knife, to cut out the passages of the Bible that uh, Bultmann didn't like. And he called it the Bultmann Bible. And when he flipped the pages, you saw how the Gospels were empty because it didn't fit his philosophy. This can be an example of judging the truth of the faith according to a rational philosophy. And people do it to each other too. A lot of times people will have a theory about who we are and they will reject you because you don't fit their theory. Instead of dealing with the real person that you are. Well, that's the same thing with God. You don't use a philosophy or a theory to eradicate the things God says about himself and just eliminate them because they don't fit your philosophy. That's not good theo Christian theology. And this went on with lots of things. Um, some of you can remember days in the 70s and 80s and even later when speaking of God as the Lord, using the male pronoun he for God, this was forbidden by some, because they had a philosophy about what God and, and reality is. And even though the Lord God speaks of himself as Father, I remember being fired from saying Mass at one Catholic woman's college because when I read the Gospel of John 17, they said, you have to stop using the word Father. And I said, well, you know, A, I didn't write it, so I can't change it. And B, calling God Father was the whole purpose of that text. And that he's, Jesus says, Father, by your name, keep them one. Well, if you take away Father, the name that's meant to keep us one, then of course the, the foundation for unity is gone according to what Jesus taught. But that didn't fit these women, these nuns' theology. So they, quote, invited me not to come back. That's their nice way of saying that they fired me. <laughs> so this is, these are some of the errors. Um, also, some theologians don't have enough philosophy. They don't know how to use philosophy and they allow themselves to be swayed by various assertions in the culture and, and different ideas that go on, uh, but are not well read and are not well versed in uh, theology. And uh, you see this in the encyclical, excuse me, the um, Vatican I document, uh, Dei Filius, 
chapter 3, where, it's, where the Vatican Council said, as regards this faith, the Catholic Church professes that it is a supernatural virtue. By that you note, know, faith is a gift from God, a gift of grace. That's what supernatural virtue means. It's a supernatural virtue by means of which, under divine inspiration and with the help of grace, we believe to be true the things revealed by God, not because of the intrinsic truth of the things perceived by the natural light of reason, but because of the authority of God himself. So I don't believe it just because I can figure it out with my little pea brain, but I believe it because God reveals it and that God cannot deceive or be deceived. It goes on in chapter 4. Reason is never able to penetrate these mysteries of God as it does the truths which are its proper object. Philosophy can understand a lot of important things that are part of human reason, but the things that God tells about himself is what God chooses to reveal. It's not just part of reason. The Christian faithful not only have no right to defend as legitimate scientific conclusions, uh, opinions which are contrary to the doctrine of the faith, particularly if they are condemned by the church, but they are strictly obliged to regard them as errors which have no more than a fraudulent semblance of truth. So we, and you know, think about it for yourself too. If somebody said horribly that you are a woman and therefore you don't know how to think, I assure you that nearly every woman I know would tell you exactly what they do think <laughs> about that opinion and about that person. You can't say, I have a philosophy by which women are unthinking beings. That would be absurd. They're rational human beings, like men, and they have different perspectives than men, but they're rational human beings, and to deny because it doesn't fit my theory. Or if you say, you know, I came from, you know, a certain kind of a family background. Well, people from your family background can never be educated. But I have an education. No, it doesn't count. It doesn't fit my theory. If you reveal something about yourself and somebody else says, well, that doesn't fit my theory of Catholics, women, people from Canada, people from Kentucky, or anything else. What is the truth? Their preconceived ideas or the facts of your life and what you share with them. It's the facts of your life. You cannot live primarily in a world of theory, but you must deal with the facts and make your theory big enough to fit reality. That is key. And a lot of people want to say, no, no, no. What my theory is is more important than what you think is reality. I'll make my own reality. That, by the way, is going to, if you go to see this new movie about Noah, you'll see that this guy has his own version of reality. <laughs> has nothing to do with the book except that there's water in a boat. But uh, <laughs> apart from that, it's his own little world and his little theory, and this is the world that I like. By the way, he doesn't include even mention of God in the whole thing. So again, it's what he likes. Also, the Pope goes on, that there are signs of a resurgence of fideism. Now, fideism is the belief that it's only faith and that you don't have any kind of thinking and reason in your religion. There's nothing to do with reason. It's only about faith. And this shows up uh, a lot of times, one of the way, things that's important about that is fideism does not recognize the importance of rational knowledge. So, you know, it is important, for instance, in studying uh, our faith, to know archaeology. That takes rational discovery and analysis of all kinds of very interesting data. But it doesn't fit my, my idea. So, 
You know, I, I was talking the other day, I was uh, preaching about um, the golden calf. And, you know, most people have a certain image of the golden calf that comes from the movie Ten Commandments. But in fact, archaeologists, have the largest molten calf ever found by archaeologists in the Middle East is five inches. <laughs> and they say, but then the movie was big. I know, but you can believe the movie if you want. But Cecil B. DeMille had a bigger budget. <laughs> he wasn't a better one roaming around the desert. So, you know, we have to uh, use f uh, rational knowledge, good history, etc., and philosophical discourse to understand the faith. It's important to use philosophy and thought in understanding the faith. Indeed, for the very possibility of belief in God. You know, this is, you know, a lot, of, you'll hear certain people, like Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll go around saying, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. That's right. We used our minds to think through this truth that God is one God, but also the truth that the one God revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we did come up with a new word to explain that, that you maintain both realities and we think these things through. But, um, yeah, and, and you're not going to stop us from thinking. Indeed, um, we have to use philosophy to understand the existence of God. And that's, uh, again, uh, for, if you want to do follow a discussion on the importance of reason, for a proof of the existence of God, I strongly urge you to take a look um, at the book by uh, Facer called The Last Superstition. Wonderful book on that. Also, there's a, a certain biblicism. Some people uh, use the Bible alone uh, and that exegesis and reading the Bible is the only criterion for truth. Uh, therefore, the, the the, the, one of the problems with that is they see that the Word of God is only in Scripture instead of believing what the Bible itself says. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15 where it says, Hold on to the traditions which I left you, whether by word or by mouth. So that the Scripture doesn't ever say you use the Bible alone. That's not in the Bible. If that were true, it'd have to be in the Bible. But the Bible says, use scripture and tradition. And that the word of God is present in both scripture and tradition, as Vatican II very clearly said, as did also Trent. And in, in De Verbum, in fact, in, uh, paragraph 9, it says, there exists a close connection and communication between the sacred tradition, which is not any tradition, but the tradition that comes to us from the apostles, the apostolic tradition, and sacred scripture. For both of them, flowing from the same divine wellspring, in a certain way merge into a unity and tend toward the same end. The goal of scripture and tradition is to reveal God to us. And, um, uh, the, so the, the scripture is not the only reference point. Um, the, the, the supreme rule of the church's faith derives from the unity that the Holy Spirit gives. Um, for it says, for sacred scripture is the word of God inasmuch as it is consigned to writing under the inspiration of the divine spirit. While sacred tradition takes the word of God entrusted by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit to the apostles and hands it on to their successors in its full purity. So that led by the light of the spirit of truth, they may, in proclaiming it, preserve this word of God faithfully, explain it, and make it more widely known. So, you know, there would be uh, uh, so many things in life. If you only had uh, certain uh, words, to describe how to play baseball, it would be very difficult to understand. But if you know people who can show you how to play, then it makes more sense. And there's so many other things in life just like it. You need somebody who's doing it, 
You know, for instance, you know, you can get a lot of cookbooks. And it's good to have a recipe. But it's really good to have someone who has made the recipes, tried them out, shown you, and just add just a touch more of this. The recipe says a quarter, but add more, a little more than a quarter teaspoon, and you'll s see what it does, you know, and so on. That takes experience. So it's not just what's written on a page, also the living experience of the cooking. This is important. Also in the Verbum 10, it says the sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God committed to the church. Holding fast to this deposit, the entire holy people, united with their shepherds, remain always steadfast, so that holding to, practicing, and professing the heritage of the faith, it becomes on the part of the bishops and faithful a single common effort. So that's why, you know, I'm going to be pretty critical of a book like, or excuse me, a movie about Noah that doesn't mention God, even though the Bible text makes it about God, where it portrays uh, uh, Noah as not such a good guy, uh, when in fact that's why he survived. He was a good guy. And one of the things that we also see is that sacred tradition and sacred scripture and the church magisterium go together. We can't have one without the other. That's why again, De Verbum, paragraph 21 says, the church has always venerated the divine scriptures just as she venerates the body of the Lord. It's since, especially in the sacred liturgy, she unceasingly receives and offers to the faithful the bread of life from the table, both of God's word and of Christ's body. The church has always maintained them and continues to do so together with sacred tradition as the supreme rule of faith, since, as inspired by God and committed once and for all to writing, they impart the word of God himself without change, and they make the voice of the Holy Spirit resound in the words of the prophets and the apostles. So the, the scripture is not just about my philosophy, but it's about what does God tell us about himself. Moreover, one should not underestimate the danger inherent in seeking to derive the truth of sacred scripture from the use of one method of study alone. Now, he understands the history of Bible scholarship because what's happened over the, cent over the last oh, 125 years or so, maybe a little bit longer, is that they'll get a method of studying the Bible and say, oh, this is the way you understand. Now we know what it means. And then a new method comes. No, 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 that's not enough. Got, this is how it, you get what the meaning is. Then another method. So it went from source criticism to form criticism, which took the Bible into little parts. And they said, no, 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 you got to take a look at the redaction, that is, the editing, how it got put back together again. So that's, and then tradition history, well, how did these ideas go? And, and the Pope is saying here that all of these methods are themselves good. I, I use them, but they're tools. And you have to be careful that, uh, and this is one of the issues, a lot of times Bible scholars have their own philosophy that they don't talk about. I'm just being an objective Bible scholar. And they don't know or they don't pay attention to the philosophy underlying their method. And people say, well, you know, the Bible scholars, I've heard this over the years, Bible scholars say that this, the, the multiplication of loaves and fish didn't happen, or that miracle didn't happen, and that Jesus never said, Bible scholars now say, Jesus never said this, or he never said the Our Father, and all that. They go on and on and on. To which I, having read, you know, lots of Bible scholars as part of my research, will ask, which Bible scholar was it? And then, why are you listening to that person? 
instead of somebody else? Do you have a reason for that? Well, no, it's a Bible scholar. Believe me, Bible scholars do not agree amongst themselves at all. That's how they get their dissertations. They refute each other constantly, and they disagree with each other. So you need to also use reason to understand what is behind the philosophy of that Bible scholar and comprehend his view and then evaluate whether his view and whether his results are well-based or not. Or is he just following his own bailiwick and that there are lots of other Bible scholars, which I assure you there always are, who disagree with him. They don't buy it and learn to think about these things. That's what the church tries to get us to do. All right, we're going to take a break, come back in a couple minutes, and get some questions from our studio audience, from you, and our email. So please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. First of all, we'd like to invite you to come and join us. Um, it's, it's not the warmest spring we've ever had in Alabama, uh, but it still is pretty. You've seen all the pear trees and white blossoms and the red buds and the tulip trees and the forsythia. I saw a whole yard full of tulips yesterday and all kinds of pretty stuff. So. We certainly urge you to come on down and join us and be part of our studio audiences. You can contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to the website ewtn.com and they'll give you information about scheduling of programs and all sorts of things uh, to help you out here. We'd love to meet you over here. All right, we, let's go start off with a caller. We have Hilda on the phone. Hello, Hilda. Oh, hello, Father Parkway. Hi, where are you from? I'm from uh, New York. Great. New York, Rockland County. All Farm right, Hill. good to see you. And what's your question? My question is, uh, I, I would like to hear your answer to this now, because it's reason that I'm using from the Bible is not in the Bible. But they say that this is the that we, we're the, made in the image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. Now, and then my reasoning, how is this? How can we be, you know, he's three in one. I said, so are we. We have a mind, a heart, and a body. And these sometimes work together, sometimes independently. So what do you say? Well, I say it sounds like you might have started reading some St. Augustine in his book, De Trinitate, uh, because, in fact, uh, St. Augustine does talk about one aspect of us being made in the image and likeness of God as having a reason and memory and will. He didn't mention the body so much as those aspects of our personality that are distinctively human. The other animals also have bodies. And they have some memory, but they don't know how to use it the way we do with reason and will. They follow instinct. So he, uh, he does uh, something similar, and I urge you to take a look. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you can get on the internet, uh, you can download all of St. Augustine's wonderful, wonderful book uh, on the Trinity, 
or De Trinitate in Latin, and there's an English translation, of course. Uh, you can get the De Trinitate from our website and take a look at that because that is one aspect. Another aspect of being made in the image and likeness of God that Augustine already brings out is that we can think and make decisions based on thought uh, uh, as well as memory, so that this is uh, very important, and not just the threeness, but having those abilities. And then Pope uh, uh, Blessed John Paul II also brings out that just as the Trinity is a community of three equal persons who are one, we also are people who are born for communion with each other, that everybody's person has an inherent dignity and that we want to live out on the basis of that dignity, uh, what, what we're supposed to do. So this is uh, some very important aspects that um, uh, there's always more reflection to do on that too. So keep it up, Hilda. Question from our students, ma'am, where are you from? Good to have you here. What's your question? My question is, the Bible says, I knew you before you were born. Mm -hmm. I knew every hair on your head. Mm -hmm. I have interpreted that to think like this, that we are spiritual beings in the other world, mm -hmm. and we come to this world to do God's will. Mm -hmm. And your question about that is? Uh, what do you think about that? I think it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For one, th here's, here's, now think, about, think of that biblical passage, and it gets at, this gets at reality. I knew uh, every hair on your head. Yes. In the spiritual world, yes. are there hair? We don't know. <laughs> you don't? You think spirits have hair? We, do we know? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> hair, be hair belongs to a body. Yes. And in fact, when you are conceived, it, you know, your body grows hair all over, you know, being that we're mammals, and it's only as the body grows inside the womb that there are hair follicles for God to be able to count, which he can do perfectly accurately. The Second Council of Constantinople, in fact, took up this issue because that theory had been proposed in the third century by a priest named Origen, who believed that all the souls were created at the beginning of the world, and then they just enter into the bodies. Whereas, and that was an idea that was a, uh, came from, we're talking about some of these issues, it came from a philosophy. He was influenced by a late form of Plato's thought. It was called late Platonism. And Plato believed that the soul transmigrated. Whereas, you know, what the, the, the texts that you speak of are referring to before we're born, not before we are conceived. It doesn't say that you even existed before you're conceived, but rather that at the moment of conception, God creates a soul. It's part of the great dignity of women. You know, in the world of matter, there's no new creation. God doesn't make any new matter. The only, all the matter just gets transferred and reshaped and reused. A lot of recycling that goes on. But where God still creates is in the wombs of women. When he creates a soul that is in, from that point eternal and not from an earlier point. And the knowledge that God has before we're born, it can count our head, the heads, uh, hairs on our uh, head and all over the body, is uh, something that happens after there's hair to count, which is after the body is conceived and hair follicles form. It takes a few weeks, but uh, not very long. Uh, your fingerprints and your, um, the hair follicles, I believe, are all formed by seven, eight weeks.
So it's pretty early. And from then on, he's going to deal with you. <laughs> All right, we have an, uh, an email here. Dear Father Mitch, at the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel tells Mary though, that the Holy Spirit will come upon her to conceive a son in her womb. Now, no one knew about the Trinity yet. What was the Jewish understanding of the Holy Spirit at that time? Joe in Brooklyn. Well, you see a number of places where the Spirit of God, usually they speak of the Spirit of God, Ruach Lahim, uh, in the Bible. Uh, the earliest use is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, Ruach Elohim Hamayim, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, the face of the waters. And the idea is that there was this watery chaos that in Hebrew they called tohu v'bohu. And this is something uh, that is uh, uh, part of the, what the Holy Spirit does to prepare for the Word of God to be spoken. The Word through whom everything came into being. So there are hints of the Trinity at creation. And then a number of times uh, you, you'll see, Joe, uh, in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit comes upon the prophets. Numbers 11 is one place where a whole group of men in Israel get the prophetic spirit. You see other groups in uh, the first book of Samuel where even King Saul gets the Holy Spirit. And, uh, or the Spirit of God, as they would call it. And a number of other times, uh, Ezekiel mentions how the Spirit of the Lord was upon me. So they'll, they'll speak of that. Now, they don't have as great a clarity as Jesus gives us, but they do have a un beginning understanding of it. And they, they, uh, it's from Christ that we'll learn more about the Trinity. All right, now we have another caller. Hello, Tom, you're on the line. Oh, hi, Father Mitch. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Boston. Oh, great. Nice town. <laughs> uh, I have a thank you for taking my call. Sure. My question is about forgiveness. Sure. Um, I know that our faith teaches us that if we confess our sins and are sorry, that God forgives our sins. Sure. Okay. Um, but it seems to me that being the case, we have to ask for God's forgiveness by mm -hmm. entering into the sacrament sure. of reconciliation. Sure. Okay, and likewise, we are taught that we must forgive others as God forgives us. My question is, what about the person that offends you, sometimes repeatedly sure. for years on end, mm -hmm. but never apologizes mm -hmm. and never asks for your forgiveness? Mm -hmm. Does God expect us to forgive them? All right, here's something I would say. Um, I think most of us, uh, certainly I, myself, can relate to such a situation. This is a fairly common human situation. And I think the model for that will be Jesus Christ our Lord on the cross, where he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. He not only forgives them, while they are still standing there jeering at him. They're still making fun of him. They're ridiculing him. If he's the Son of God, come on off that cross. And all of those things that they're saying. And he still forgives them and even comes up with an excuse for them. Namely, they're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. Now, we can do that in imitation of Jesus Christ. But in terms of bringing about, the, and also, by the way, we also can do that with the sense of the beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And I'm to be merciful as he is merciful. Now, what this does is when I let go of you know, the, the, what they've done and forgiven them, there are a couple things to keep in mind. One, that prepares me for the day when 
they do say they're sorry. I don't know if that'll happen or not. But if they do, I'll be ready for it. I already have started the forgiveness. I don't wait until that moment, but I'm ready for it. Secondly, it also helps you to let go of some of this stuff. You know, you don't keep churning that hurt. And one of the things I strongly recommend when people bother or hurt you, that you pray for them. It really, really is hard to stay angry at somebody you're praying for. So it's really hard. So that's a good thing. Thirdly, that does not mean that you therefore entrust them with much until they do show repentance. You don't say, all right, you, you stole from me uh, 10 times. I forgive you for all of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you borrow. Or I'm going to let you come in my house where I have my money and I'll trust you to walk around my house. No, that's not wise either. You know, you don't want to tempt them to more sin or foolishness. So you have to let them learn to build up that trust again so you can trust them. But you start off forgiving them. You learn to let, uh, and if they do reconciliation, then you learn, let them learn to be trusted. Take time. But uh, you need to be ready for that. And if they don't repent, that's up to them and God. And you don't, you're not in charge of that judgment. And God will take care of that. All right, we have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Hamilton, Ohio. Good to have you. Welcome. And your question? Uh, my question is, what do you think is the most prevailing philosophy in the world today that is bringing about and leading to a lot of the evil that we find in the world today? Sure. I, I think the most prevailing thing going on is, is twofold. One, it is a lack of philosophical reflection. People are not even thinking about what their actions mean. They are not thinking about the philosophy that they hold. They ignore it. They ignore the question. That's what we're talking about today. A lot of people just don't bother to analyze what their basic thoughts are. That's the biggest problem. And they're not given the equipment on how to think about things. They don't know how to sit back. That's the biggest problem. Secondly, under, underlying a lot of this is base, what's, what's called in the past idealist philosophy, where the world is really all about my ideas of the world. I don't know the world itself. I only can know my ideas about the world. This was a, 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 some, a variety of schools of philosophy in the uh, late 17 and early 1800s. And people, that, again, think of the movie Noah, some guy who can make rock people and have Mo Noah as a different kind of character than was described, and that the whole story has nothing, no mention of God. This is, this is my view of it. And then once you accept that I don't know the real world, I only know my ideas about the world, then I go back to the next most prevalent thing, which is relativism. I have my ideas, you have your ideas. And there's no basis by which I can judge which one is true because I'm not dealing with the real world. I'm just dealing with my ideas. So you have yours, I have mine. And that relativism is also dominant, dominant. And it's at the root of so much of what we're going through in our politics, in Congress, and in our morals, and what's going on in Hollywood, and so on. And that's where I have to think and deal with the real world. All right, part of the real world is we have run out of real time. So, Lord, bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by the intercession of the Blessed Mother who said yes to God, may you also always say yes to Him. 
Also, we want to remind you this is your network, so please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you.